It is now time for question period. Her Majesty's loyal opposition leader. Thank you. I must my question for the Premier. Premier, today uh, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce released a letter outlining needed changes to your payroll pension tax. Over 150 businesses, including 57 local chambers of commerce and some of the province's largest employers, have signed that letter. They know your payroll tax will kill jobs in Ontario. These employers outline many of the same concerns that we raised back in April as part of our five budget asks. Premier, anyone reading the Chamber's letter would come to the same conclusion we came to long ago, that your pension plan is the wrong way to go. So I ask you, will you do the right thing and withdraw your damaging pension payroll tax? Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, you know, uh, it's interesting uh, because I, uh, I read that article and I understand that uh, I understand that there are uh, questions being asked. But I also know that a fundamental part of the development of this plan is conversation with uh, with businesses and individuals around the province. And our associate minister of finance has been doing that work, Mr. Speaker, because that's how good policy gets written. Good policy is written by listening to the people who are on the front lines, Mr. Yeah. Speaker, listening to the businesses who understand what the impacts will be. But at the end of the day, Mr. Speaker, it is extremely important that people in Ontario, and I would argue across this country, have security in their retirement, that they do not work their lifetime and then retire into poverty, yes, Mr. Speaker. That's what our Ontario Retirement Pension Plan is about, is providing that security for people. Thank you. When they are finished their work life. Supplementary, the member from York Central. Speaker, and again to the Premier. Mr. Speaker, currently the Ontario Registered Pension Plan won't exempt employers who offer a defined contribution plan or group RRSPs, even though both plans provide a far higher rate of return. Instead, you're going to punish business owners who already look after their employees' retirements by forcing them to pay yet another burdensome task. Employers can't afford to pay both. We all know they'll cancel the only one they're allowed to cancel, the higher-paying plan they already offer. Brilliant. So again, Premier, before it's Remember too from late, Prince Hastings. will you walk away from the ORPP. Mr. Speaker, uh, I know that the Associate Minister of Finance is going to want to comment in the, uh, the supplementary, but Mr. Speaker, the fact is that the vast majority of Ontarians, 77 per cent of Ontarians, support an increase in pension benefits. They know, Mr. Speaker, that what they are being presented with in their retirement and as they look forward to the retirement of their children and their grandchildren, which is why organizations like CARP, Mr. Speaker, are supportive of, first of all, an enhancement of the Canada Pension Plan, which the federal government has decided not to do, Mr. Speaker. But secondly, if that's not possible, they're, they're supportive of the Ontario government stepping up and taking that action. And Mr. Speaker, those people are living in every riding in this province. Across this province, people are not able to save enough for their retirement, Mr. Speaker. They know that, and they're Member concerned Bruce about Sound. their own retirement, Answer. and they're concerned about the retirement of their children and their grandchildren. Yeah. Minister of Agriculture. Yes. Supplement, uh, final supplementary. Yes, thank you, uh, Mr. Speaker. This isn't just a message from the opposition bench. These are some of the Ontario's largest employers who have signed this letter. General Motors, Ford, Canadian Tire, Walmart, Magna, the list goes on. There are associations ranging from mining to hospitality, from manufacturers to farmers. There is across-the-board opposition to the Liberal payroll tax. Between skyrocketing energy rates, a looming carbon tax, and your payroll tax, the cost of doing business in Ontario is far too high and is costing jobs. Employers in Ontario Minister of Economic the Development. enough is enough. Premier, why won't you listen Question? and withdraw the ORPP? Thank you. Thank you. 
Associate Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and I want to thank uh, the members opposite for the question. Uh, in fact, Mr. Speaker, we are very much engaged with the Ontario Chamber of Commerce and its members. Uh, we've met with dozens of, uh, of companies and the associations uh, representing those companies because we know, Mr. Speaker, that. Uh, uh, pensions are very important. Uh, that we know that retirement security is a very important issue in this province. Um, as the premier has said, 77% of Ontarians uh, believe that enhancements are needed to retirement benefits. Here. And, Mr. Speaker, we're taking leadership on this issue uh, through the consultations that we've done across this province. Uh, we have heard uh, differing views on what is to be deemed as comparable. Some folks would prefer universality, while others would prefer a narrower definition. What's important, Mr. Speaker, is that we're analyzing this feedback and we're going to be making the Thank best you. decisions for the yeah, people yeah. of this province. Yeah, yeah. New question, the Leader of the National Seas Royal Opposition. Back to the uh, Premier, Mr. Speaker. Premier, the auto industry has been the backbone of Ontario's economy for decades. When you took power, almost one in five Ontarians were employed by the automotive and parts manufacturing Those industry. As your government's energy policies and many other policies have driven jobs out of the economy, it's now only one in eight. Ontario needs to remain competitive in the auto industry. The industry won't be able to survive if your mandatory pension plan makes our economy even less competitive. Member from Beaches, East York. Premier, will you at the very least expand the comparable pension definition? The member from Beaches, East York, to second time. Auto industry as they've asked and the Ontario Chamber of Commerce have asked in their letter today. Excellent. Mr. Speaker, well, I know the Minister of Economic Development and Employment is going to want to speak specifically to the auto sector, but Mr. Speaker, I would just again repeat to the uh, leader of the third party that it is extremely important that the people of this province, no matter where they work, Mr. Speaker, no matter what sector they work in, that they have the prospect in their retirement of a secure retirement. We know that there are many people, Mr. Speaker, many young people who are not able to save enough. That is why we have made the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan a fundamental pillar of our, uh, of our economic plan, because that kind of security is important for individuals and families. It's also important for society, because those very businesses, Mr. Speaker, if in a number of years they are confronting a society where there is a, a generation of people who don't have the wherewithal, Everyone will have Answer. to pay, Mr. Speaker. Everyone will have to deal with that reality. So we are thinking ahead and we are putting in place the supports that we know people will need. Excuse me, I should have said the member from Glengarry Prescott Russell, not the member from uh, Beaches East Shore. The member from uh, Wellington. My Hall question Hills. is also for the Premier. In a letter addressed to the Premier, which was made public today, the Ontario Chamber of Commerce and a large coalition of companies, including General Motors, Ford and Chrysler, are urging the Premier to allow defined contribution plans to be considered as comparable plans and allow them to be exempted from the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan. Defined contribution plans are more affordable for employers, but still offer some measure of retirement security for employees. Mr. Speaker, the auto industry needs to have the option to switch to defined contribution pension plans for their workers in the future so that they can remain competitive and continue to assemble vehicles in Ontario over the long term. Will the Premier commit to making defined contribution plans comparable? Good question. Thank you. Associate Minister of Finance. Good Minister of Finance. Thank you, Speaker, and uh, I want to thank the member opposite uh, for the question. We've actually met with uh, many members um, of the auto sector to talk about uh, the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan and the plans that they currently have. And, Mr. Speaker, we know that there are very generous defined contribution plans that exist. At the same time, Mr. Speaker, we have to balance the fact that people need a predictable stream of income into retirement that they can rely on. And, Mr. Speaker, with the the, the feedback that we have received, uh, we are in the process of looking at who is going to be affected by the Ontario Retirement Pension Plan, the who are the members Lanark. that will be uh, required to be part of this plan, and uh, we want to ensure at the end of the day that we strengthen retirement security Member for people Stormont. in this province Answer. so that when they retire, Mr. Speaker, that they will have that income that they will retire on, it, re rely on in their senior years, yeah. and that is the Thank focus you. of the Ontario Retirement Plan. Plan. Again, back to the Premier. The fact remains that sky-high electricity prices, high taxes and excessive red tape have already cost us hundreds of thousands of manufacturing jobs 
and thousands of jobs in the auto sector. Many are going south of the border, and we're losing out on new job-creating investment. The ORPP means higher payroll costs for business and less take-home pay for workers, and it will only exacerbate the trend of lost manufacturing jobs. The Premier should know that GM's commitment to Oshawa expires next year, and the government is consciously and deliberately making it harder for GM to stay. Will the Premier recognize the folly of her policy and take this simple step which will give hope to auto workers that their future employment will remain secure? Thank you. Minister. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, Mr. Speaker, we are the only government that is committed to enhancing retirement security for Ontarians. Hey, hey. We know that Ontarians are not saving enough and that they need to take action now so to ensure that people are prepared for their retirement. Mr. Speaker, economy. Finish, please. Economists agree that we need to take action. Just today, CIBC's Deputy Chief Economist Benjamin Tao stated, and, to, and it, it all, it, and add it all up, and there are some 5.8 million working Canadians who will see more than a 20% drop in their living standards upon retirement. He went on to say, Answer. "That's why the time to act is now." Mr. Speaker, that's why we are acting with the. Thank you. Thank you. New question. The leader of the third party. Speaker, my question is for the Premier. Yesterday, the Premier said, and I quote, what we have to do as a government is take a position, which we did in our platform and in our budget. We have to explain that position, and then we have to move forward, end quote. The problem is, Speaker, the Premier has two positions. Not only did she not run on the sell-off of Hydro One, but in October, months after the election, she said, we're not selling off the assets. And her finance minister said, we are not going to sell off our assets. Now she's claiming that selling off Hydro One was the plan all along. If the Premier can't decide, how about she lets Ontarians decide through a referendum? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. So we've been very clear on our uh, plan to maximize assets. Let me just go through this again, Mr. Speaker. We talked about it before, during, and after the 2014 election. So, and an April 11th news release, uh, Hydro One was in the headline. The Ontario government has appointed a council to recommend ways to improve the efficiency and optimize the full value of Hydro One. Yeah. It was featured in our election platform. It's mentioned three times in our budget, Mr. Speaker. So the 2014 budget, and I quote, so will look at maximizing and unlocking value from its assets it currently holds, including real estate holdings, as well as Crown corporations such as OPG, Hydro One and the LCBO. Page 164 of our budget, Mr. Speaker, uh, and I quote, valuable assets include large and complex government business enterprises such as the LCBO, Hydro One and OPG. The government will launch an in-depth review process, unquote, Mr. Speaker. We were very clear that in order to pay for transit and transportation infrastructure, Thank we you. needed to leverage those assets, Mr. Speaker. Stop. So the Premier is trying to go back in time and say it was her plan all along to sell Hydro One and that she was clear about that with Ontarians. But in April of this year, Speaker, a constituent wrote to his local Liberal MPP because he'd heard for the first time that the Liberals were selling Hydro One. He was told by that Liberal MPP's office that, quote, reports regarding Hydro One are premature and that, quote, no final decisions have been made about Hydro One. And now those backbench MPPs are going to have to explain to their constituents that the sell-off was the plan all along. Stop the clock. Start the clock. Order, please. Please finish. Those backbenchers are going to have to explain to their constituents that this was the plan all along. Speaker, Ontarians deserve. Thank you, Stop. I will immediately start uh, warning individuals that are starting to shout people down. Ontarians 
deserve honesty, Speaker, and the Premier needs to listen to them. Will she hold a referendum on the sell-off? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. As I have said, we were very clear that we were going to uh, we were going to review the assets that were owned by the people of Ontario in order to unlock their value, Mr. Speaker, to invest in infrastructure that's needed. Now, you have to remember that this line of questioning that the leader of the third party is on is a direct attack on the investment in infrastructure that is needed in this province, Mr. Speaker. The leader of the third party has no plan. She has no solution for how to invest in infrastructure. The fact is she ran on exactly the same fiscal plan that we had, Mr. Speaker, apart from the fact that she said she would take $600 million more out of, uh, out of the budget than we had uh, put forward, Mr. Speaker. But she has no plan for how she would invest in the roads and the bridges and the transit across this province that are needed in order for us to be competitive. So the fact is, Mr. Answer. Speaker, that the explanation that needs to come from the leader of the third party is how would she make those investments or would she just cancel the Thank projects you. that are already underway and planned? Thank you. Final supplementary. Speaker, the Premier said to me yesterday that she was, quote, explicit in our budget and in our platform and then in our budget again about her plan to sell Hydro One. But the fact is her own finance minister didn't know, Speaker. Liberal MPPs didn't know. And as of April, her MPPs were telling constituents that it was premature, premature, just in April, premature to be talking about the sell-off of Hydro One. A referendum would be explicit, Speaker, yes or no. Maybe that would help the Liberal backbenchers figure out where they stand on this issue, Speaker. Will this Premier agree to a referendum on the sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, I would suggest we all just worry about our own team. How about that? understand is that there was a process that we said we were going to look at our assets, Mr. Speaker, and we were going to make decisions, some of them very difficult, but some of them that are necessary in order to make Finish, please. decisions that were necessary in order to make uh, good on the fundamental commitment that we made to invest in infrastructure in this province. So, Mr. Speaker, it's true. At some point Answer. along the way, final decisions had not been made, but the decision has been made now, Mr. Speaker. We are going to make those investments, not Thank something you. that the leader of the third party supports. Thank you. Question, the leader of the third party. Well, Speaker, I worry about Ontarians. That's who I worry about. <laughs> To the, uh, Premier Speaker. the Premier says she ran on selling Hydro One, but for months before and after the election, she denied that speaker. Now she's denying her denial. I don't blame Ontarians for wondering what is going on with this Premier. What's been very, very clear and consistent, Speaker, this entire time is that the people of this province cannot afford this wrong-headed scheme to sell off Hydro One. So, will the Premier settle this nonsense once and for all, put an end to the doublespeak, and agree to a Hydro One referendum so the people can have their say? Premier. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Mr. Speaker, what we cannot afford to do in this province is not invest in the infrastructure that we need. You know, all the questions about jobs and the questions about the economy and the questions about business in this province, whether it's auto sector or whether it's aerospace, Mr. Spe Mr. Speaker, or whether it's high tech, all of those industries, Mr. Speaker, are looking to government to make the infrastructure investments that they need. That's part of creating the conditions so that businesses can thrive so that more business will come here. Mr. Speaker, the fact is we are the number one jurisdiction for foreign direct investment again this year, Mr. Speaker. We're not going to stay there if we don't make the investments in infrastructure. 
infrastructure that are needed. So what we are committed to doing is making those investments. The third party doesn't support that. I get that, Mr. Speaker. Answer. But the fact is, we have made a commitment to invest in that infrastructure, and we're going to do it. Mr. Speaker, Ontarians were kept in the dark about the Premier's plan to sell Hydro One. Liberal cabinet ministers were left in the dark about the Premier's plan to sell Hydro One. Liberal MPPs Minister were of kept Aboriginal in the Affairs. dark. They kept their constituents in the dark, Speaker, Member from about Barry. this plan. The Premier kept everyone in the dark. Now she's tying herself in knots to claim that this was Mr. her Energy. plan all along, Speaker. Will the Premier put all of this to rest and simply give Ontarians the say that they deserve on this issue Deputy and House Leader. a referendum on the sell-off of Hydro One? Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Speaker, again, I would just say to the, uh, the leader of the third party, it was very clear in our budget, in our platform, and in our budget, again, that we were looking at assets, Mr. Speaker, council. and that we were looking at the sale of assets. We talked about the Crown Corporations. We we talked about the review that was happening. We talked about the GM shares. We talked about real estate, Mr. Speaker. It was so clear Member that the leader of the third party said this on July 9th of 2014. She said, and I quote, the budget says in black and white that the government is looking at the sale of assets, including Crown corporations such as Ontario Power Generation, Hydro One, and the Liquor Control Board of Ontario. Mr. Speaker, it was so clear that we were looking at how we would leverage those assets that even the leader of the third party understood, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Final supplementary. Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Pointing out how sneaky the, the Premier was being, Speaker, in that quote. Ontarians are sending a very clear message, Speaker. Stop the sell-off of Hydro One. First, the Liberals said selling Hydro One was a terrible idea. Then the Premier said she's thinking about selling Hydro One. Or, to be more specific, she is thinking of recycling legacy assets. She said she's not selling Hydro One. Then she said she's selling Hydro One. Then she said she never said she wasn't selling Hydro One. Speaker, the Premier has more versions of this story than Pat Sorbera has job offers for Andrew Olivier. Will this Premier, will this Premier stop this nonsense Question. once and for all and agree to do the right thing by the people of this province and hold a referendum Thank on you. the sell-off of Hydro One? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. Premier. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, once again, we made a decision that it was critical that we invest in the infrastructure that's needed in this province, across the province, roads and bridges and transit, Mr. Speaker. In order to do that, there needed to be uh, there needed to be funding, there needed to be revenue in order to do that. We needed money in order to make that investment, Mr. Speaker. And so we reviewed our assets, and there was a process, Mr. Speaker. And I will say to the leader of the third party and to Ontarians, this has not been an easy decision. This is not not an easy decision on the part of the people of uh, part of the members of this party mr speaker of this government but we know that if we don't make those investments in infrastructure mr speaker that will be irresponsible it would be irresponsible for us to not invest in the infrastructure that is needed for the for the future generations whether it's the businesses of this province mr speaker or whether it's the individuals who are having trouble yes, getting sir. around because of gridlock those investments must be made we made a commitment and that's what we're going Thank to you. do Thanks, Speaker. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. Minister, yesterday police were forced to shoot a bear because the MNR was unable to respond in time. Even though the bear had been sighted on the weekend and staff received a call at 6.30 Monday morning, the MNR was not prepared. Why was the MNR not unprepared and unresponsive? Minister of Natural Resources and Forestry. 
Speaker, thank you very much. Well, in fact, uh, Speaker, the member should know if he was following this uh, incident in the newspapers that the MNRF were prepared. Right through the entire weekend, they provided the technical assistance. Finish, please. Speaker, right through uh, the incident over the course of the weekend, the MNRF provided the technical assistance that exists in the protocol between police forces in the province of Ontario and the MNRF. They did that. When the call came in for assistance, I believe it was Monday morning around 6.30, the MNRF began to mobilize their forces as required and did their best to respond to the scene. That's the way it transpired. That's the way it went down. Unfortunately, I will say, Speaker, we know that the incident ended in a way that no one wanted to see. Uh, the animal had to be put down. That's an unfortunate result. Answer. Having said that, in direct response to the members' questions, the MNRF was there and doing what they were expected to do here, here. under the protocol. Here, here. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, back to the minister. Minister, there's no reason at all the ministry couldn't mobilize on a Saturday or Sunday when they first heard about the bear and be ready to roll. Minister, last year, your colleague, the former Minister of Natural Resources, David Orzetti, was quoted as saying, when you look at incidents in schoolyards when children can't go out for recess, teachers wearing bear whistles, city police officers having to shoot black bears in the middle of communities in northern Ontario, it's not acceptable. Do you not agree with your colleague? However, you said yesterday that nuisance bears are not the responsibility of the MNR. Minister, you're minimizing public safety, and have you downloaded your responsibility to the municipalities? I know. I know. What's the minister? Speaker, when a sighting is reported to the MNRF, um, if the MNRF, according to your question, was expected to respond in some way, shape or form, Member I don't from know what, is it, what it is you expect they would do, the MNRF would be all over the province, all of the time, 24-7, when there's a sighting. That's not what they do. It's not what they did five or ten years ago, and it's not what they're expected to do today, Speaker. That is unacceptable that you would expect that that would be a, re a requirement on the M MNRF. When they got the call, Speaker, that the animal had been localized, they responded as per the protocol that exists between local police forces and the MNRF. It's unfortunate that the animal had to put down, Speaker. I would say this is not a question of resources, as was implied by the member Answer. yesterday in the media. That is not at all the case. And In fact, MNRF spends far more money today on an annual basis than they did when that yeah, member's party yeah. was in power. New question. The member from Toronto, Danforth. Thank you, Speaker. Speaker, last year, this question to the Premier. Last year, the Ontario Energy Board approved a request by Enbridge Gas for an incredible 40% increase in the price of natural gas, equal to a $400 increase per family per year. One of the two board members who approved that request was Marika Hare. We've learned that Ms. Hare worked for Enbridge for 15 years and served as its Director of Regulatory Affairs. And now the Premier has promoted Ms. Hare to be Vice Chair of the Board, of the Ontario Energy Board. Why, why is the government stacking the Ontario Energy Board with people who built careers fighting for the energy industry instead of people who fight for consumers Question. and Ontario families? Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board has tremendous credibility as an independent agency. It does its job. It does it well, Mr. Speaker. The reality is they're dealing with technical issues and they need technical people on the board, Mr. Speaker, who understand the sector representing the people of Ontario after they're appointed, Mr. Speaker, to suggest that somebody that has extensive experience Mr. Speaker, to suggest that somebody has, who has extensive experience in the sector is not qualified to sit on a board that deals with these issues, Mr. Speaker, is just wrong. Mr. Speaker, the Ontario Energy Board has provisions that deal with conflict of interest. They can declare their interest the same as any other yes, board, sir. whether it's a Crown Corporation, Mr. Speaker, or a private sector company. They have rules about conflict of interest, Thank but you. they also seek out the best in the business. Thank you. Supplementary. Speaker, last week I pointed out that the government was stacking 
the Ontario Energy Board with energy industry insiders. And I asked the Minister of Energy how such people could be trusted to put the interests of Ontario families ahead of the interests Minister of the energy industry. Of economic development. The Minister said that conflict of interest guidelines party. would protect Ontario families ah. at the OEB. We now know that these individual conflict of interest guidelines do not prevent OEB members from approving 40 per cent rate increases on behalf of their former employers. Wow. With the Ontario Energy Board now stacked with energy industry insiders, why should Ontarians trust that the board will stop massive electricity rate increases on behalf Question. of a privatized Hydro One? Mr. Speaker, first of all, the member would know that after that increase that he referred to was made, the Ontario Energy Board made rulings which significantly reduced them, ah. balanced them out, spread them over time, Mr. Speaker. And when the announcement was made for those reductions, Mr. Speaker, we never heard a peep from that particular member, Mr. Speaker. The, uh, the, energy, the uh, gas rates today in Ontario, Mr. Speaker, are much better than they were five, six, seven, eight years ago, Mr. Speaker, and that's because of the Ontario Energy Board. Thank you. New question, the member from Ottawa South. Uh, this is uh, for uh, Native Affairs. Events with a walk for reconciliation from Gatineau to Ottawa City Hall. Over 11,000 people attended, and I had the honour of joining you and the Attorney General and the member from Ottawa, Orleans, at the walk, and to show the commitment of this government to renewing its part relationship with our Aboriginal partners. Mr. Speaker, it was really quite impressive to see. People from different walks of life, different ages, the number of people over there, the, the faces, it really left a lasting impression on me. And we know that the residential school system is one of the darkest times in Canadian history. Approximately 150,000 children and youth were taken from their homes, placed in schools, often by force. The commission was established in June 2008 to ensure that the stories of survivors from the residential schools Question. were not forgotten. Mr. Speaker, through you to the Minister, can the Minister please inform the House on the mandate of the Commission? Thank you. Minister Gabriel, uh, Speaker, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission was indeed a solemn moment. The Commission is gathering stories from survivors and providing recommendations to governments so our history is not forgotten. In 2012, the Commission released an interim report which found residential schools constituted an assault on Aboriginal children, families, and Aboriginal communities and their cultures. The Commission also released a series of recommendations for the federal and provincial governments. Speaker, this government is following up on those recommendations. As Ontario's Minister of Aboriginal Affairs, I have visited over 50 First Nations in the last two years. I have met with Aboriginal leaders and members of the communities from all corners of the province. I have come to understand that as people Answer. we share a difficult history, today the Commission will release its final report. Speaker, there is a moral imperative to deal with the Commission's recommendation. That's why our Premier led the Ontario delegation. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. And of course, we were led on Sunday by the Premier, who was there as well. Le mois de juin et le mois national d'histoire autochtone, c'est moi, nous. The month of June is national, the national month of uh, Aboriginal history, and this is an opportunity for us to reflect upon the culture, the contribution and the resiliency of these communities. Ontario has Canada's largest Aboriginal popula population. We know that understanding the history and culture of Aboriginal people in Ontario it leads, leads to a better friendship between Aboriginal people and Ontarians. For reconciliation to succeed, all Canadians need to understand the history we share with our Aboriginal peoples. And this month, being National Aboriginal History Month, presents an opportunity for all Ontarians to become more aware of our true and Question. shared history. Aboriginal, Aboriginal culture and contributions Aborig, Ab, Aboriginal communities make. Can the Minister please update this House on his experience at the Truth and Reconciliation Thank you. Commission? Thank you. Minister. Speaker, we will continue to support our Aboriginal partners' efforts to restore the vitality of their culture, which is central to their communities. 
We will continue to do our part to educate and raise awareness among Canadians of our shared history and the painful place residential schools have in it. One of the most important steps we can take, Speaker, is education and awareness of the non-Aboriginal community. The Ministry of Education has partnered with First Nations and my ministry to develop resources that will assist educators in planning student learning about residential schools. Ontario is also working in partnership with Aboriginal people and communities to create an awareness through our three-year treaty engagement and public awareness strategy. Speaker. And the reason we are doing that is because in Ontario, yes, we are all treaty peoples. Whether we're Aboriginal or non-Aboriginal, we are all treaty peoples. Thank you. Thank you. Any questions? Be seated, please. Be seated, please. Thank you. New question, the member from Leeds Grenville. Thanks, Speaker. My uh, question is to the uh, Premier. Premier, your Hydro One fire sale leaves seniors who call me about soaring electricity costs or Hydro One billing nowhere to turn for help. You're putting Hydro beyond the reach of MPPs, the Ombudsman, everyone. The minister responsible for seniors knows that's wrong because he once said, and I quote, there is nothing the public of Ontario will benefit from with the sale of Hydro One. That is why we should try to protect this wonderful facility, which, if sold, will not come back into the hands of the people of Ontario anymore. Premier, did the minister even try to stand up for seniors before you asked him to abandon his principles, or did he just roll over like the rest of your cabinet? Minister of Energy. Minister of Energy. Mr. Speaker, uh, the member somehow thinks that the programs that we have to mitigate rates will not continue, Mr. Speaker. We have significant programs that mitigate rates, Mr. Speaker, including the Ontario Energy and Property Tax Credit, Mr. Speaker, which gives qualified seniors up to $1,041 back per year, Mr. Speaker. We have still in place, Mr. Speaker, the, uh, the program that gives a 10 percent reduction on all bills, Mr. Speaker. We also have in place a low energy program, Mr. Speaker, which gives up to $600. We're implementing another low cost program, Mr. Speaker, that will give a family uh, with an income of $28,000 and four children $525 back on their electricity bill. Mr. Speaker, they will continue to go forward on, 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 on our agenda, Mr. Speaker, and it's, it's a false Answer. conclusion that he's making that rates are going to go up, and in the supplementary, I'll talk about the Thank Ontario you. Energy Board, which that party also supported. Supplementary. Yesterday, our leader, Patrick Brown, launched a petition against giving away this invaluable public asset. It's a good petition, Speaker, but you know what? I found one I like better. Your Minister of Northern Development and Mines proudly read it into the record on May 15, 2002. We, the undersigned, petitioned the Legislative Assembly of Ontario to encourage Ernie Eves to take Dalton McGuinty's advice to put working families ahead of his Bay Street friends by immediately stopping the sale of Hydro One. Premier Eves did the right thing in 2002. He listened to Ontarians who signed that minister's petition. Like Will you respect the thousands of Ontarians signing our petition today at stopthehydrofiresale.ca by pulling the plug on this bad deal? Start the clock. Minister? Speaker, uh, the party officers have a uh, strange memory. Uh, Mr. Speaker, they, they issued a policy paper uh, only about a year and a half or so ago where they were proposing to sell off to the private sector significant interest in Hydro One and OPG, Mr. Speaker. And, Mr. Speaker, what were they going to rely on to protect seniors? Their white
Mr. Speaker, their white paper stated specifically that they recognize the from that the consumer the prices from Leeds, Grenville, second time. The, consumer, the member from Nipissing, second time. Speaker, would continue to be protected and regulated by the Ontario Energy Board. That's their paper, Mr. Speaker. And incident. The member from Nipissing is warned. Carry on. And speaking of uh, their Third. new leader, Mr. Brown, Mr. Speaker, his quote. The member from Leeds Grenville is warned. Wrap up. Okay, one sentence, Mr. Speaker. The quote from the leader of the PC party. I generally believe that the private sector can do a better job than the public sector. Uh, I generally think more. Okay. After the warning comes the naming. New question. The member from uh, Windsor West. Thank you, Speaker. My question is to the Premier. Speaker, yesterday the Minister of Education claimed that class size caps are not on the table. In reality, we know there are efforts to replace hard cap language with flexible guideline language. Either the Minister has no idea what is being discussed at the table, or she is experiencing cognitive dissonance. <laughs> the facts are clear. Removal of class size caps means less one-on-one -on -one time for our kids, less resources for kids with special needs, less time spent with kids with ESL needs. Speaker, is the Premier committed to throwing our schools further into chaos by removing class size caps, yes or no? Minister of Education. Minister of Education. Yes, thank you. And uh, uh, I think it's important to make clear that at the central table, there are actually three parties there. Oh. There's the uh, union representing the workers. There is the school board association representing the boards, the employers, and there is the, the government, uh, the crown. And what I think you will find is if I check the record, I said that the government did not have class size caps on the table. I think what you would also find if you check the record from uh, Mr. Barrett, the president of the Ontario Public School Boards Association, that as they have said, they do have that. So what I said was 100% accurate. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Speaker. So if I understood that correctly, then the government side is not in support of lifting the class size caps, so we can look forward to those caps remaining next year. Back to the Premier. Again, e either the minister has no idea what is being discussed at the table, or she is prepared to allow our kids to fall behind. Class size caps matter. Flexible guideline language has no real meaning and is not enforceable. Our kids deserve better than being forced into overcrowded classrooms so the government can save a buck. Yes. Families and students deserve more than a $250 million in-year cut to education on top of more than a decade of underfunding. Kids need one-on-one -on -one time, and they should not pay the price for short-sighted liberal cuts. Speaker, will the Premier commit to holding the line on class size caps and guarantee families and students Question. there will be no change to class size caps in the fall? No more Thank you, the, I, I, I don't think that there's much point in saying he said, she said, but I think there is a lot of point in understanding the way the funding model works. We paid at $22.5 million billion. Member from Hamilton East Stony Creek, second time. Five billion in funding is being flowed. The class size ratio within that funding model for secondary schools is 22 to 1. That has been the class size funding model as long as I have been uh, involved as an MPP. In fact, it's also with the exception of being. Uh, bigger classes during the NDP social contract. I think it's also been the class size generator as long as I was a trustee. 22 to 1 is the long-standing yes, class size generator for uh, the funding model for secondary schools in the province of Ontario, and we have not requested any change to that. New question. The member from the Thank you, Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question is to the Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. As Ontarians are well aware, our manufacturing sector is hit hard by the global recession. Fortunately, to quote the Canadian Federation 
of independent businesses. And I quote, Speaker, we've seen a rebirth in manufacturing. However, it's important that we continue to support our. I'd appreciate if the member would not make comments while he's exiting. Carry on. I know our, our latest budget, our government has extended the accelerated deduction for investments in manufacturing, processing machinery. This important step will continue to encourage the growth of the sector. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, could we please inform this Question. House on the future outlook of Ontario manufacturing sector? Wow. Thank you. Minister of Economic Development, Employment and Infrastructure. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I'm pleased to say that I have some good news to report on Ontario's uh, uh, manufacturing sector. In the latest report from Stats Canada, Ontario's manufacturing sector gained 1,200 net new jobs, Mr. Speaker. And the month before, in March, we gained another 800 net new jobs. And, and, you know, according to RBC's Canadian Manufacturing Index, confidence in Ontario's manufacturing sector continues to rise from 55.5. Uh, or from 54 to 55.5 in the last month, Mr. Speaker. That's really good news, and that's despite all the efforts the opposition are making to talk down our gains in manufacturing. Our province's confidence index is now well beyond the national average of 49.8. RBC is predicting that our province's manufacturing sector will continue to lead the country. Answer. This is good news for our sector, it's good news for our province, and we'll continue to work with our manufacturing sector to thank keep you. it going, Mr. Speaker. Well, thank you, Mr. Speaker. I'd like to thank the minister for that answer. It's good to hear that the steps our government has taken are having a positive impact on the sector. And that the end, that outlook for Ontario manufacturing is quite positive. Not only with the growing manufacturing sector creating many direct jobs, but will create indirect jobs as well. While this is a positive news for constituents in my writing, we know that there are still people in Ontario looking for work. Through you, Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, could, <coughs> could he please inform this House on what further action our government has taken to encourage job growth in Ontario manufacturing sector? Thank you. Minister. Mr. Speaker, the recent budget that we brought in continues to support programs that continue to strengthen our economy and, in particular, our manufacturing sector. For instance, we're increasing the Jobs and Prosperity Fund by $200 million to $2.7 billion. This will help Ontario to continue to secure large investments in our manufacturing sector, investments like Honda's expansion of Alliston in Alliston, for, for example. We're continuing to support the Southwestern and Eastern Ontario Development Funds. These funds have invested $120 million, leveraging $1.3 billion in private sector investment, creating or supporting 31,000 jobs, 90, over, well over 90 per cent of which are in, the, uh, private, are in the manufacturing sector. Mr. Speaker, we're extending the accelerated deduction for investments in manufacturing and processing. That will ensure another $500 Seventy-five million dollars in our manufacturing sector. Mr. Speaker, thank we'll you. continue to work with the sector. Thank you. No question. The member from uh, Central North. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker. My question today is for the Minister of Education. Minister, in 98 days, two million students in Ontario should be starting their new school year. Sadly, the two-tiered disaster bargaining system is halting almost all negotiations, including the class size debate. And we know that you're promoting the guideline option. Your dithering over the past eight months is now causing a real chance of turmoil in the next school year. Now, all teacher federations in Ontario are on the brink of either all-out strikes or major disruptions starting this fall. So, Minister, are you prepared to assure Ontario parents that these disruptions and strikes will not occur come September the 8th? Thank you, Minister of Education. What I can absolutely assure people of is that we will continue to bargain. There are three months left before the next school year. I continue to believe that the only way that we will solve the various problems is by negotiating a collective agreement. And in fact, central negotiations do continue uh, with, with uh, various teachers' unions. Welcome to uh, Melinda Chartrand, who is the uh, president of the French Catholic Trustees, who's in the gallery this morning. And, uh, 
we, we continue to uh, negotiate in partnership with the various school board associations, with various uh, teacher federations, and uh, that will continue. Yes, and uh, I strongly believe that we will be able to reach agreements before Thank the uh, end of the summer. Well, supplementary. So, Minister, I, I'm not sure if you actually understand how serious the situation is. Uh, with the non-bargaining that is taking place, and we have no agreements with none of the 72 boards, with the non-bargaining, you have just a little over 13 weeks to resolve all of the classroom teacher education issues that you expected Bill 122 to resolve. We are likely going to hobble to the end of this school year, but parents of 2 million students across Ontario will be on pins and needles worrying about the beginning of the school year in September. So, Minister, by the beginning of August, if you have not made serious progress, and judging by the inaction over the, uh, the past nine months, I expect you won't, are you prepared to bring the House back to take action in, in August? Thank you. Minister? That was fascinating because what I think I just heard was a request for us to impose by legislation a collective agreement. And I absolutely reject that. We believe in negotiated collective agreements. We are Finish, please. As I have said repeatedly, Speaker, we believe that the way to arrive at good collective agreements Answer. is to negotiate them, and that's exactly what I will be doing over the next three months. Thank you. No questions? The member from Brown, Lee, Gormald. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. My question is to the Premier. The Premier's office stopped independent journalists from showing footage in the Premier's, that the Premier's office agreed to shoot. We hear this is because that footage might have shed some light into the Sudbury bribery scandal. Now, someone in the Premier's office. The Please finish. Thank you very much. Someone in the Premier's Member office from Lanark, second is time. keeping that footage secret. Maybe it's a Premier. Maybe it's Pat Sobera. Who in the Premier's office is keeping the documentary from seeing the light of the day? Thank you. Premier. Well, Mr. Speaker, as I've said, uh, as I've said in this House, we worked closely with the uh, producer to determine the parameters of the film, Mr. Speaker. I haven't seen any of the footage, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I still, uh, I still hope that uh, that the uh, documentary can be played because, Mr. Speaker, in the first instance, it was uh, a, about putting in place a documentary that would, would replace or would augment uh, a much earlier documentary that was made during the, uh, the Davis era, Mr. Speaker, about how government works. That was the point of the documentary. That's why I agreed to it, Mr. Speaker. I haven't seen any of the footage, and uh, I, uh, I hope that it can go forward as an educational tool, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. Supplementary. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Well, the Premier welcome, did indeed welcome cameras into the back rooms, but then something was caught on film, and the Premier's office went into lockdown. We've heard that maybe this has something to do with the Sudbury bribery scandal. We want to know, but more importantly, the people of Ontario want to know. What was caught on tape that spooked the Premier's office so much that they're keeping the— Please finish. Thank you. So what was caught on tape that spooked the Premier so much that they're keeping this footage secret from the people of Ontario? Thank you, Premier. 
<laughs> Mr. Speaker, the, um, the member opposite makes my life and our lives sound very intriguing, but Mr. Speaker, what happened was um, we worked closely with the producer to establish the parameters of the film, um, which was, as I said, to be a behind-the-scenes look at the preparation of the budget, Mr. Speaker. Over the course of the filming, uh, there were some concerns. We had some concerns that the project was deviating from those original parameters, Mr. Speaker. We shared those concerns with the producer, and our sole that was our sole contact, Mr. Speaker, was the producer um, on the uh, the project. It wasn't uh, it wasn't TVO, Mr. Speaker. There was always a clear understanding that we would have no editorial control, and that was uh, that was understood. But um, that we would be allowed to review portions of the film with government lawyers for issues like breaches of cabinet confidentiality or privacy legislation, Mr. Yeah. Speaker. Answer. That, that review was supposed to happen, Mr. Speaker. And as I said, um, we were ready to sign off on the final product. I hope that it can be seen, Mr. Speaker. But I have not seen any of them. Thank footage. you. The question, the member from Sudbury. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, my question this morning is for the Minister of Northern Development and Mines. Mr. Speaker, just last week, the Ontario Mining Association hosted their seventh annual So You Think You Know Mining High School Video Awards. And I'm pleased to say several high schools from my great riding of Sudbury took home some of the awards. Mr. Speaker, I know that our Premier, along with Remember the Minister from of Northern Development James and Bay, Mines, second colleagues time. from all sides of this House were present at this great event. This is an event that gives students an opportunity to learn about Ontario's expertise in geology, engineering, and our mining exploration and production industries. Mr. Speaker, when it comes to mining, Ontario has the advantages of a strong economy, competitive business costs, and world-class research and development environment, Mr. Speaker. So, can the minister inform the House on the status of the mining Question. industry in Ontario and its significance to our provincial economy. Thank you, Minister of Northern Well, Northern thank Northern you Mines. so much, Mr. Speaker. I thank the member for subject to the question, and it was wonderful to be uh, joined by Premier Wynne and nine or ten of our legislative colleagues at the uh, Ontario Mining Association's seventh annual So You Think You Know Mining Award Show, which is a which is an extraordinary opportunity for high school students all across the province to actually put together award-winning videos about the mining industry. So what they were doing is they, these were extraordinary videos that highlight the fact that there are currently 43 mines operating in uh, the province of Ontario, including 14 base metal mines, 16 gold mines, and one diamond mi mine. It was wonderful to be part of that. Also, to highlight the fact that we have two new mines opening up in Ontario this year. I was recently at the groundbreaking ceremony for a new gold mine near the, radio the new gold project near Fort Francis. So there are many exciting things happening in the mining sector of Ontario. Yes, sir. Great to have them celebrate at that video award show. Thank you. Supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. It is part of our government's plan to build Ontario up by creating a dynamic and supportive environment where business can prosper. Ontario is a leader, Mr. Speaker, not only in the Canadian mining industry, but also globally. There are hundreds of international companies in Ontario engaging in mineral exploration and hundreds more in the supplies and services se sector who benefit from that investment. And, Mr. Speaker, the Minister of Northern Development and Mines has made it clear that our government is doing just that when it comes to the mining sector. The global mining economy is evolving, and new competition is always emerging. Mr. Speaker, I know our government is committed to ensuring that Ontario remains a world leader in mineral exploration and mining investment. So, Mr. Speaker, can the minister tell the House what our government is doing to maximize Ontario's potential and support a Question. modern and innovative industry, ensuring that Ontario's mining sector continues to thrive for decades to come. Thank you, Minister. Well, thanks again, uh, Speaker, and, and the member is so right. It's, it's incredibly important that the mining sector remains competitive. That's why we are so proud of the uh, uh, making the Northern Industrial Electricity Rate Program a permanent program, which is a huge uh, help to the major resource developers in Northern Ontario. And may I say there are other very important incentive programs that have been put in place uh, by the Minister of Energy. Uh, for example, the industrial uh, electricity in incentive program, not well known, the IEI program. I know that the Minister of Energy and, may I say, the MPP for uh, Sudbury were uh, recently showcased the new uh, uh, Victoria mine uh, that's under development, the KGHM mine. We, we know indeed that Detour Gold, uh, a huge gold mine uh, in Northern Ontario, is actually
actually been able to uh, have a six-year industrial electricity incentive contract reducing their energy costs. Yes, Rubicon Minerals uh, in Red Lake, a, a, a project that will be opening up and commissioned this year, and we're going to be there for the opening sometime uh, later this summer. Another one. Thank you. New question. The member from Farm Hill. Monsieur le Président, ma question Mr. Speaker, my question is for the Minister of Education. In the House today, more than 100 students and parents from Hamilton. We have uh, physical establishments uh, under which were obsolete 15 years ago. Of this side of the house, we believe that francophone students um, can expect uh, modern schools with the same quality of uh, other students in Ontario. Minister, why do students and family have to wait another 15 years for school? And thank you. Uh, uh, welcome to uh, the students who I think the students that are here are uh, French Catholic students from Hamilton. So, uh, welcome to the house today. Um, Certainly, we have had a high priority in making sure that we fund francophone education in Ontario. It might interesting you, interest you to know that the uh, funding for French language education has increased by almost 80 per cent since we took office. So if you compare that to the overall funding for education, which has increased 56 per cent since we took office, obviously we have been making significant investments in our French language system. Uh, in Answer. particular, uh, when it comes to new schools, we've spent $1.3 billion building 79 new French schools. Mr. Speaker, to the Minister, later today I will table 2,500 numbers uh, of people from Simcoe North and Renfoot Ward asking for, for a new school. Minister, what do you say to these two to, who wish to have another school? Yes, thank you. Um, well, the process for, for uh, applying for a grant for a new school is that you have to make uh, a good business case. And unfortunately, in, the, in this particular case, uh, the business case was not a strong business case. What we have done, however, is we have offered uh, 25 Point nine million dollars to build a joint oh, French school great. for both public and Catholic students Excellent. in Hamilton. That would be a grade 7 to 12 school. Uh, the French public board has accepted the offer. The French Catholic board has not. However, our offer remains on the table that we would love to build a new joint French language school for public and Catholic. And we have models of over the province, where we have French boards working together, English boards working together, French and English boards working together. Thank we you. know this model works. Thank you. Minister of uh, Transportation on a point of order. Thanks very much, Speaker. Speaker, we're joined today in the galleries by some individuals who are here in anticipation of the vote coming up on Bill 31. If I could introduce Rick Donaldson from the Ontario School Bus Association, Scott Watson from Parachute Canada. Angelo DeChico from Young Drivers of Canada and his colleague Jim Kilpatrick. We also have some student representatives from Arrive Alive, Melissa Montaneri, Natalie DeFelice, Tori Peacock, Brian Patterson from the Ontario Safety League, and the ADM from MTO's Road User Safety Division, Heidi Francis. Thanks very much, Speaker. Thank you. Well, Speaker, we have a guest here today. I just want to introduce Maddie Fuller, who I met last week at an event honoring 25 years of public service for Mr. Glenn Murray. Welcome to Queen's Park. Thank you. We have a deferred vote on the amendment to the motion to apply a timetable to certain business of the House. Calling the members, this will be a five-minute bell.
Would all members please take their seats? All members, please take your seats. On May 27th, Mr. Nackley moved government notice of motion number 40. On May 28th, Mr. Clark then moved that the motion be amended as follows that in each of the sections A, B, C, and D, bullet number two be struck out and replaced with the following, that the deadline for request to appear be 2 p.m. on Thursday of the week that the bill receives second reading. Dispense? Agreed. All those in favour of the amendment to the motion, please rise one at a time and be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Arnold. Mr. Huda. Mr. Huda. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Mr. Miller, Perry, Sound, Muskoka. Mr. McNaught. Mr. McNaught. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urich. Mr. Urich. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Hillier. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Vantal. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Monta. Mr. Monta. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Ms. French. Ms. French. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Nackby. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sanders. Ms. Sanders. Mr. Duguid. Mr. Duguid. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Berardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Rosetti. Mr. Gavell. Mr. Gavell. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Manga. Ms. Manga. Mr. Pratt. Mr. Pratt. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Ms. Dahmerla. Ms. Dahmerla. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dahl. Mr. Dahl. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Hogarth. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Ms. Naidu Harris, Mr. Potts, Mr. Potts, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Rinaldi, Mr. Mr. Tebow, Mr. Tebow. All those opposed, please rise one at a time. Be recognized by the clerk. The ayes are 95, the nays are zero. The ayes being 95 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Are the members ready to vote on the main motion as amended? Agreed? I heard a no. The orders, uh, the, this item will remain on orders of notice paper. Given the circumstances, I'll test the House again. Are the members ready to vote on the main motion as amended? Agreed? Agreed. Mr. Nackley has moved notice of motion number 40. Is it the pleasure of the House that the motion as amended be carried? Carried. Carried. On division. Carried. On division. Um, Mr. Nackley. Oh, sorry. We now move on to the next item.
We have a deferred vote on the motion of the third reading of Bill 31, an act to amend the Highway 407 East Act 2012 and the Highway Traffic Act in respect to various matters and to make a consequential amendment to the Provincial Offences Act. Call in the members. This will be a five-minute bill. On April 20, 2015, Ms. Sandals moved third reading of Bill 31. All those in favour, please rise one at a time. You be recognized by the clerk. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Del Duca. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Nackley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Shirelli. Mr. Madame Mayor. Madame Mayor. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Wynn. Ms. Matthews. Ms. Matthews. Mr. Hoskins. Mr. Hoskins. Ms. Sandals. Ms. Sandals. Mr. Duga. Mr. Duga. Ms. McCharles. Ms. McCharles. Mr. Cole. Mr. Cole. Mr. Takar. Mr. Takar. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Bardinetti. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Quadri. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Orzetti. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Gravel. Mr. Murray. Mr. Murray. Mr. Chan. Mr. Chan. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Moridi. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Coteau. Mr. Leal. Mr. Leal. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Flynn. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Zimmer. Mr. Mr. Delaney. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Balkas. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Albanese. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Dixon. Mr. Manga. Mr. Manga. Mr. Crack. Mr. Crack. Ms. Wong. Ms. Wong. Ms. Hunter. Ms. Hunter. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Sergio. Mr. Morrow. Mr. Morrow. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Jassic. Ms. Domerlo. Ms. Domerlo. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Fraser. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Anderson. Mr. Baker. Mr. Baker. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Ballard. Mr. Dong. Mr. Dong. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Hogar. Ms. Koala. Ms. Koala. Madame Lalonde. Madame Lalonde. Ms. Molly. Ms. Molly. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. Martin. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McGarry. Mrs. McMahon. Mrs. McMahon. Mr. Milchin. Mr. Milchin. Mrs. Naidu. Mrs. Naidu Harris. Mr. Potts. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Rinaldi. Mr. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Tebow. Mr. Harris. Mr. Harris. Mr. Arna. Mr. Arna. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hudak. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Hardiman. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Wilson. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Fidelli. Mr. Clark. Mr. Clark. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. Miller Perry Sound Muskoka. Mr. McNaughton. Mr. McNaughton. Ms. Jones. Ms. Jones. Ms. Thompson. Ms. Thompson. Mr. Barrett. Mr. Barrett. Mrs. Monroe. Mrs. Monroe. Ms. Scott. Ms. Scott. Mr. Urick. Mr. Urick. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Bailey. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Hilliard. Mr. Walker. Mr. Walker. Mr. Smith. Mr. Smith. Mr. Nichols. Mr. Nichols. Ms. Marteau. Ms. Marteau. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McDonnell. Mr. McLaren. Mr. McLaren. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Pettipiece. Mr. Gates. Mr. Gates. Mr. Singh. Mr. Singh. Ms. Horvath. Ms. Horvath. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Bisson. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Vanto. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Tabbins. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Mr. Miller Hamilton East Stony Creek. Ms. Taylor. Ms. Taylor. Mr. Natasha. Mr. Natasha. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Armstrong. Ms. Fife. Ms. Fife. Ms. Forrester. Ms. Forrester. Mr. Montau. Mr. Montau. Mr. Hatfield. Mr. Hatfield. Mrs. Gretzky. Mrs. Gretzky. Ms. French. Ms. French. All those opposed, please rise one at a time be recognized by the clerk. The ayes being 95 and the nays being zero, I declare the motion carried. Third reading of the bill, Twasian Lecture, Division of Law. Be it resolved that the bill be now passed and be entitled as in the motion. There are no further deferred votes. This House stands recessed until 3 p.m. this afternoon.